So what you've been told about uric acid is probably dangerously wrong. And I wanna set you right in four steps. Well, the first thing you need to know that it's much more than gout. Gout doesn't affect everybody with high uric acid levels. And even if you don't have high uric acid levels, you need to know what your levels are. It's a cheap lab test. You can get at it and you can go to Ultra Labs and there's a link in the description, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about understanding why uric acid is so important. And it is very important for you. So gout, supposedly the first case of gout was 2,640 years before Christ. So roughly about 5,000 years ago in Egypt. What do we know about that? Well, they called it podegra because it showed up on the foot, which it still shows up on the foot, primarily in most people. Very painful, excruciatingly painful, like you have a foot of splinters. And in fact, you do have a foot of splinters. You have a foot of splinters that are made up of monosodium urate crystals that get into the joints. So even Hippocrates, uh, which is what, 400 years BC, called it the unwalkable disease. Still about feet, still about painful feet. And you have to ask, why did it happen then? I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. But it did exist. And it's a pretty much in the same situation. It presents the same way now as presented then. But there's a different reason now. And the rates of gout, for instance, have more than doubled in the last 15 years. Arguably, they've quadrupled in the last 40 years. So that's amazing. So something has happened that has never happened before to cause those rates to go up. Well, one of the reasons we've had such an increase over these last decades, and you could arguably say back since World War II, so it's about 70 years or the last 70 years, is certainly what we're eating. Uh, that's sort of an overgeneralization, makes it easy to, for everybody to agree, right? But um, our evolution had a different plan for us. And what I mean is that roughly about six to 14 million years ago, called the Middle Miocene, it was a ice age. Things were getting worse and worse and less and less areas to find food available. We incurred four different mutations, or we lost the abilities to do things that even turtles can do, or your cat can do, or somebody, but we can't do them anymore. One is uh, we can eat fruit and we can digest fructose to an extent, not a large extent, but to some, so we can have fruit, pretty straightforward. We no longer can get rid of, uh, if we eat too much protein, too much nitrogen or too many purines, which is the source of increasing uh, uric acid, turtles and most mammals, except for the great apes and all our relatives, that uh, they can no longer do that. They've lost the ability to get rid of excess uric acid. Before it would just go out, that's what your, your case was. But there's a benefit there. The benefit was this. The only time of the year that you actually increased uric acid was in the fall. Is when the fall you were eating, you began to eat more fruits, gather more fruits, because that's when they grew. And so you, it gave us the ability to grow fat. When you had too much uric acid, you started to produce fat. And that was a good thing to an extent. You lost it all come springtime. So you could store your energy with you. You were much more mobile. Pretty straightforward. That's a, that's a good thing. The other thing we uh, acquired back about six to 10, 000, uh, 10 million years ago was the ability to partially digest or to digest alcohol, some better than others. And we still have, uh, on a per person basis, it, our ability kind of varies a lot. But why is that a good thing? Why was that a survival thing? Well, as first we learned to be able to eat fruit and fructose didn't bother us and we could digest it and eventually convert it to glucose. Uh, that was a good thing. Um, the other thing is if you didn't get the fruit right away, it fermented on the ground and it did become various degrees of alcohol. So the alcohol was no longer a toxin. Alcohol is a toxin, but we break it down into acetate, which is vinegar. Uh, acetic acid. That's pretty clever, you know, so the, and that's all comes down to the liver, by the way. The liver takes in the fructose and it makes it into a, eventually makes it into glucose. But if there's too much fructose, it can't do that. 
and it starts making fat. And what it causes is a fatty liver and a lot of other problems. Same with alcohol. It can do a little alcohol pretty well, but too much alcohol and it causes pretty much the same reason. So we have a limitation. We have a little bit of ability now that we didn't have before, and that's a good thing. The other ability that we lost once we started learning to be able to eat fruit is that we no longer can convert our glucose to vitamin C. So it's our personal responsibility to eat our vitamin C, hence fruits. We're back to fruits. Sounds like it's a fruit story for the most part, and it is. So these are the changes that happened, and even a turtle can it has your case, so it can overeat, if you will, and not have the problem. You don't get fat turtles. Uh, you don't get gouty turtles, for that matter. There's only two ways to get elevated uric acid, hyperuricemia, if you're looking for a bigger word. That is overproduction, right? So you're overproducing it. We'll get to why in a second. Or you are under excreting it. You're not giving it to the urine, to the stool to get out of your body. So that limitation, those are the only two things. So either we're limited in our ability to get rid of it, or we are overproducing it for some reason. That's really never been a problem before because the only time uric acid got to be too high was coming into the fall and the spring where our vegetables and basically our evolution tends to teach us that we didn't have enough food, so we basically learned to use our own fat. So it was a survival thing. It clearly allowed for subsequent generations to live that wouldn't have been able to live before. Okay, that's a nice story. That's pretty much how you've been told. And everything kind of works pretty well. We're mobile, we can get fat when we, when we need to, we can live on the fat, kind of like a bear. It's a, the comparisons are often been to a bear. Omega-3, omega-6 is a very similar story, by the way. But what's happened? Well, in the last 70 years, if not the last 20 to 30, there's been an outrageous amount of fructose in our foods. So the forms of fructose are pretty straightforward. You go, well, that's high fructose corn syrup. It all came from the corn, and that's a whole nother story, which is fascinating. But that high fructose corn syrup, it's sucrose. It's sucrose is made up of glucose and, and fructose. High fructose corn syrup has a slightly higher percentage they say 55% or so. But that's where your fructose. So now we're having much more sugar than we ever had before. And we're talking about the fructose part of sucrose, fructose part of sugar. It's become so cheap. And one extra level is that fructose by itself has become a sweetener. It's become this supposed benign sweetener. Add it to your food. It's in a lot of food already. It's certainly in most processed foods. But so now we're getting double, triple, four times the amount of fructose that turtles ever could dream of. The great, great apes certainly don't have that much in the way of fruit. And the other thing about fruit, we tend to think of, you know, we evolved to eat it for the calories and the idea that it gives us glucose, which is really the currency of our energy. But fructose in a fruit, a whole fruit, comes with a lot of things. It's not just fructose, of course, and it's not just sugar. There's a lot of vitamin C, or there's some vitamin C in all fruits, some more than others. And the vitamin C tends to balance the, the negativity of the fructose. Pretty amazing for one fruit. So that's what we evolved to eat. We're fruity users in a way. So we no longer have that balance. We're way out of line with fructose. And so consequently, we what does fructose do? Fructose comes to the liver. The liver can make part of it into glucose. But because we're eating so much of it, it quickly gets depleted. And what happens is it now ends up being fatty liver. It starts making fat triglycerides if you want to. It makes a real problem for our health. And we see that in various other labs. But it jacks up the uric acid primarily because the fructose stimulates the insulin and the insulin tends to stop the secretion of uric acid. Why would it do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but basically that's what happens. It's about being a growth hormone in part, insulin. The other is, so where does this production come from? Where does the production of uric acid come from? All right, it comes from purines. That's been the story. That's the story you've been told. Well, it's red meats, it's seafoods, 
it's uh, cured uh, meats and so on, those are the sources, the high sources of protein, especially mackerels and anchovies and sardines and so on and so forth, and dried, as I said, dried, cured. All right, so, but that's part of it. Actually, most of your purines come from your own metabolism. It's the breakdown products of your liver, if you will. It's the breakdown products of RNA and DNA and nucleotides all together. So most of it, well over half, is what you make for yourself. So you're always going to have a, a uric acid level. The question is, it's high or not. Then when you add in diet, if you really did I'll have a high purine diet, the high purine diet is going to jack it up a little bit, but not much. In fact, when people go on what they call a low purine diet, which was advocated for in the late 1800s by a guy named Alexander Haig um, in 1880s to 1920s, is that besides being a boring diet, it really wasn't that effective and it was torturous to stay on. But they did have a low purine diet. It was tried and it made a small difference. So we say it's fructose. So the story you're being told right now, it's life has changed, processed food. It's all about fructose. Fructose is up and consequently our, our uh, uh, uric acid is up and our purines are up. So again, fructose, because we're trying to break it down in the liver, increases our purines as side effects or side products. So th the production has gone up endogenously, but at the same time, the insulin, which is because of the fructose as well, has decreased our secretion. So our uric acid goes higher and higher and higher. So to leave you a, something actionable to do is that one is you need to know your levels. You need to get your labs done. You can either get a meter. Uh, we use a meter at home that I'll show you about in another video. But that self-awareness of your uric acid level, how it fluctuates during the day, if you can only do it one time a day, if, should you get a meter and take it at the same time every day, you'll get really good information about yourself. As you get more comfortable in doing that, then you start saying, well, what about before and after a meal? What about before and after a workout? What about before and after sleeping? You need to know these things and you need to know your range. So the range, if you're really above five and perish the thought of your eight, nine, 10, 11, in up to 14 and so on, you clearly need to look at this and take it seriously. And by the way, I wouldn't have any one meter or any one lab be the definitive answer. You need to compare them over time so you get the bigger picture. Anytime, uh, certainly I always think about lab error. So you need a collective of data points so you can go, okay, now I see where the normal is. And so you create your baseline. So first you need to learn to measure it, whatever that is, meter at home. And there's a number of meters. I'll show you what we use later. And then you need to know about how to address it. So the big things to do, I've talked about fructose till the moon comes home, till the cows come home. And the other is alcohol. Alcohol was the primary cause back in 2,640 years BC, nearly 5,000 years ago, and probably in pre-Hippocratic um, Hippocratic times as well. It was alcohol pushed them over by being the burden of their liver that I've already explained to you. But the other is eating. I, I'm, I'm pretty much a carnivore. I'm, so it applies to me as well. So I have to think of these things. Fructose has never been in my life for the last couple of decades. So my life is not a fructose story. And my levels have been anywhere between, um, I'm not quite sure if I've gotten as low as four, but certainly five and uh, maybe up to nine. So I have to look at that as well. A year and a half ago, a year and a half ago? No, I think it was like three and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with a thing called pseudogout. What is pseudogout? It's like gout without the uric acid levels, huh? And it's actually a slightly different crystal. Instead of a splinter, it's more of a rhomboid thing. But they're very similar. Other than that, they know nothing about pseudogout other than you treat it with anti-inflammatories. So that's why I've gotten so critical about my uric acid numbers. I'm sure that it is very much a part of pseudogout as it is gout. They're just one's an earlier stage than the other is how I look at it. So it applies to me. I hope it applies to you. I hope you take this seriously. And if I was really to reduce it down to one simple thing, you know, if there was one lab that you should follow by meter or by going and get this lab done for yourself, it would be uric acid, more so than glucose, 
more so than glucose, more so than insulin, more so than insulin. There was a time 10, 20, 30 years ago in which they thought uric acid was just kind of this side effect. It was this unnecessary lab, but it's cheap to do, so they slapped it into the panel. And now they realize that, wait a minute, uric acid, urate in the serum of your blood, which is obviously measured in the lab, is the causative factor. It is the thing that is driving the insulin resistance, the obesity, the diabetes, the heart disease, the cognitive decline, the dementia, the Alzheimer's. It is so pan-applicable that it is very, very important. It is the one thing to follow. I would suggest being open, open your, not your mind, but open your, your willingness to look at other labs as well. But if there was one thing, this should be the one thing that you should look at. You should look at your uric acid. More coming on this. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.